All right. Whoa. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Whew, that was aggressive. Um, uh, it's great to be together. Can you turn me down just a hair? Thank you. I'm scaring myself. Um, good to be together. Hey, just, well, let me say this before I do that. Uh, I need all the children, not childness adults, uh, but children, like, I don't know, 3 to 16, let's say. If you're on the bubble, you can come anyways. But I have a little gift for you. So come on up here. Just come on up. This is going to get crazy. Make sure you know where your parents are at. Come grab a candy cane. I hope I got enough. They're all the same, so just reach in and grab one. Hey, Zeke, how old are you? Oh, okay. You're on the bubble. (laughs) Go ahead, get one. Go ahead, go sit down. Here you go. Let me come down to you. Stairs are dangerous. Wait, how old are you? Okay. Here you go. There you go. Okay, go grab your seats. All right. Good. Is that everyone? If you're an adult and you want one, you can come get one later. Um, while they're making their way back, just a quick announcement about these. Um, we're using last year's batteries, so if you turn it on now, probably not going to have it at the end. So turn them off. Uh, at the end of the service, you'll know when to use these. We'll sing Silent Night to close out our service. And um, yeah, these represent the light of the world. Jesus says we are the light of the world. And so we'll do this together, but hold on to those, and we'll use them at the end of the service. <clears throat> It's a, it's a special thing that we can come together to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Um, it's appropriate, it's necessary, it's all of those things. And I hope that you've come this evening um, ready to worship Jesus. That's the only reason we're here, to worship Jesus. And so um, we're going to read some scriptures kind of throughout our service. Uh, so let me read the first one for you. It's found in Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father in heaven, we are so grateful. Grateful that we can come yet again and celebrate the birth of our Savior. Thank you for another year of life. Thank you for another opportunity to celebrate Jesus and to worship him. 
And as we come this evening, Lord, we just uh, pray that our hearts would be right. We pray that uh, you would be with us in our service, that you would protect us and watch over us. We ask that um, we would worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I pray that as we go through the evening and as we go home from here and wake up in our own homes tomorrow morning, I just pray, Lord, that you'd fill our hearts and our families with joy and with wonder. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you all, but I so desperately need this evening, and it's just been it's just been a weird year. I don't know if you guys have noticed that at all, but it's just been an interesting year this year. And, you know, Christmas is just, I, I, I said it on Sunday that it just kind of snuck up. And I, I love that we can come together, we can focus and just take all the distractions that we've been feeling, all the stress, all the pressures, and just try and shed those tonight and do nothing but focus on Christ and his coming and just make sure that we are just ready to truly celebrate the birth of Christ tomorrow. And so with that, let's go ahead and stand together as we, as we begin our singing.
7 says, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the, of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn.
They keep me their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No well, no well, no well, no well. Born is the King of Israel. No well, no well, no well. clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold peace on the earth good will to men from heaven all oh gracious king the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing <laughs> joy to the world the lord is come let earth receive her king and every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven nature sing. No wonder no wonders of this world, no wonders of this world, heaven and heaven nature sing, nature sing, nature sing. Joy to the world. <laughs> I won't be doing that. Um, thank you, guys. <clears throat> um, let's read one more passage. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. If we were to sum up the whole Christmas story in a word, a descriptive word, we'd have to use the word humble. Humble, humility. The fact that Jesus was born into the world, the fact that Jesus came in the form of human, of, of a human, is amazing. It's, it's staggering. It takes the whole Bible to try and explain it, and even then we're left with wonder because we can't fully comprehend it. And yet, if you look at the, the details, which we have very few, surrounding his birth, uh, we're left to, to just consider that we would never write a story like this. 
if man was in charge of coming up with a story about God rescuing a sinful and lost humanity, they would never tell this story. And I think that's the point. This is in keeping with all of God's story from the beginning all the way to the end. That God delights in rescuing. That God delights in being the hero. And he definitely is the hero of this story. If man were writing this story, Jesus in coming to earth to become a man, to robe himself in human flesh, possibly would would, would look like something like this, like something out of a a movie where maybe you know the heavens open up and the glory of God descends down and, and brings the baby Jesus down, not to Nazareth or not to Bethlehem, those are nowhere towns, those are hick towns, but probably to Rome, probably to the, the capital of the known world. That's how man would have written the story. And, and man would have written the story in such a way that this celebrity Jesus would be known far and wide. He'd have billions of Twitter followers. Everyone would be watching his story unfold. Every word he told as he's growing up and then obviously into his ministry would be, would be talked about all across the globe. He'd be celebrated far and wide. But... As we just go back through these, these passages and highlight some of the details that are known to us, we would have to consider that it's all veiled in humility. It's written in such a way that the pride and the arrogant overlook it. It's written in such a way that the haughty of spirit do not even recognize it. Think about the This last passage that I just wrote, after Jesus is born in that um, little town of Bethlehem, some shepherds were out keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord, this is the part that we like, this is the angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord, appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now we're starting to tell a story. And they were filled with great fear which is what you should always do if an angel shows up to you, by the way. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. a baby lying in a manger. The story starts to diverge from what we would tell. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Then the angels went away. The angels didn't go from there to the next field over. The angels didn't go from there to Jerusalem to continue telling people about this baby, the angels went away from them into heaven. This is so bizarre. Jesus has just been born into the world, the Savior who was to come, the one who has been promised for millennia, for generations. The one who in the collective consciousness of all of Israel was the one they were waiting for, their Messiah. He's finally come. And the angels, which are God's messengers, they're messengers sent from heaven, they've come with a message which is glorious, and they themselves are glorious, but they tell it to the lowliest people around. They tell it to shepherds. They tell it to these these men who were out in the fields with a bunch of animals. Shepherds weren't despised. They were in other countries like in Egypt, but they weren't necessarily despised among the culture, but they were not looked upon with great favor. No one thought, oh, you're a shepherd. Good for you. You've really done well with your life. That's not what you thought about a shepherd. You thought, oh, you're a shepherd. Oh, you can't do anything else. That's what, that's what happened with you. And we know the, the attitude of those people that thought about shepherds from from uh, David's story. 
If you remember back to 1 Samuel 16, verse 10, Samuel has come to the house of Jesse in the, city, in the town of Bethlehem because God has sent him to anoint the next king. Saul is fallen out of favor with God. He is disgraced, and God is going to remove the kingdom from him, and he's going to give it to someone else. And so God sends Samuel, the prophet, to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his sons as the next king of Israel. And Jesse is honored to have Samuel come into his home, and and they get themselves ready. And then, starting with the oldest, they all pass before Samuel one at a time. And the Lord continually says, nope, 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 not that one. Until finally, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? He's scratching his head because God sent him to anoint one of Jesse's sons, and now these seven sons have passed before Samuel, and God has said no to every one of them. So the only conclusion, Samuel's on to it, is you have to have another son. And Jesse's response, the dad in the story, Jesse, and he said, there remains the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. You can almost hear the disdain in his voice. He's just, he's out with the sheep. Obviously, you don't want that one. He's the youngest. He's insignificant, at least in terms of family chores, because he has the lowliest chore on the list. He's out there with the sheep. And the story is, goes on to Samuel calls him in, he's anointed, and you know it's a happy ending. But the point I want to highlight is that shepherds were not highly favored among society. They were lowly positions. You spent the bulk of your time with animals. You were kind of unsocialized because you would spend days and days and days out there with the sheep. So why in the world, if God is going to send his son into the world, if he's going to tell some people, why would he tell them? Why wouldn't he have gone to the Roman legion up on the hill at the time that would have been keeping watch and told them? I mean, if if anybody could make a scene, if anybody could get people's attention, if anybody could go and spread a message, people would listen to the Roman soldiers And that was not God's plan. God told the lowliest. He told those who were listening. He told these shepherds out in the field. And I love their response. They go back into heaven. They don't tell them, they don't, the angels don't tell the shepherds, go and find out. Don't tell the shepherds, go and tell everybody you find. But that's exactly what they do. The angels leave. The shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. Obviously, these shepherds, though they were lowly in the world's eyes, were men of faith because they believed God's message and they acted upon their belief by going and looking for the child. And they went with haste and wait till the morning and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Last week or last Sunday, we we looked at the the exam or the story of when the magi came to town months later looking for this child this one who had been born king of the jews and it's it's such a wonder to us as we read these stories and we try to fit them together that more people weren't aware god sent angels from heaven to declare it uh, the the men far away in the east saw the star and they had enough knowledge to come and inquire But when they come to Jerusalem, just a six-mile journey to the north, no one even knows what they're talking about. The the, The shepherds told the message that they had heard, 
They spread it around, but guess what? No one listens to shepherds. In fact, it's written in one place that that shepherds weren't even considered legal representatives in court because they're so low on the list of everyone's, everyone's list. So God speaks to these shepherds. The shepherds are filled with wonder, but it's not the story we would have told. We would have gone to stronger, more mighty, more powerful, more influential people. And God went to the lowliest, the most humble, the most overlooked. Backing up in the story to the previous passage, when Mary and Joseph, which themselves are an unlikely pair, if it weren't for this story, if it weren't for the fact that God had favored Mary and chosen her for this specific task, and obviously Joseph as well, the world would have known nothing about them. Within two, two or three generations, they would have been completely forgotten, much like you and I, if the world persists for another two to three generations. We will be completely forgotten, like the majority of people throughout human history. But as it is, because God had chosen Mary for this task, the world knows her name. A rather unconsequential young girl living in a kind of backwoods kind of town, engaged to probably a nice guy, but kind of a nobody. He's not a big deal. Maybe in his own head, I don't know. In, the, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, who is at the time king of the world, that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. In terms of these two towns, both Nazareth and Bethlehem, they're, they're completely insignificant, except for the prophecies made about them, at least Bethlehem. This would be like going from Burns to Estacada, not in terms of distance, but in terms of uh, the, the towns themselves. They're inconsequential. They're, no, one, no one important lives there. No one important goes there. It's just where people happen to live and farm and do their stuff. But this is exactly where God had chosen to bring forth his son. They just so happen to go to Bethlehem because of the command of Caesar Augustus. Obviously, God is in charge of all of that. And as they just so happen to come into Bethlehem, Because they're from there, because he's from the lineage of David, so they go to their hometown, the the town where their ancestry is from, so they can be registered. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. What a consequence, or what a coincidence, right? What a coincidence that Caesar Augustus issued this at just the right time, and and they traveled, and they made it there at just the right time. Traveling when you're nine months pregnant, probably on a donkey, can send you into labor, I think. And yet they make it just the right time, and the time comes, and oh, by the way, there's no room even at the inn. The small little bed and breakfast is full. The Airbnb down the street is full. Everything is full. They're probably the last ones in the town because they're traveling with a pregnant wife. No offense, pregnant wives. But she probably had to stop and use the restroom a lot. And they finally make it, and all that is left is this little shanty where they keep the animals. And they, they probably brush aside some animals and they clean things up a bit and they they go in there and wouldn't you know it she has a baby and they wrap Jesus up in little baby clothes and they lay him in a manger a, a trough where animals eat 
This is unbelievable. This is staggering to think of the moment that Jesus left heaven, the highest of highs, the glorious, most glorious place in existence. And in a, in a moment, he, he leaves there and he appears on the earth and he's laid among animals in a stinky trough. Consider the fact that Mary is in an unfamiliar location. She's in an uncomfortable setting. She has no family around. She's surrounded by livestock, and Mary brings forth the Son of God into the world. This is not how we'd write a story, is it? This is absolutely breathtaking. It's staggering to think about the humility of this scene. The one who made all livestock, the one who created the universe, the one who spoke the stars into existence is now coming into existence as a man in abject humility, humble circumstances. And now back up yet again to when the time came when Mary was told about all these things, other than the fact that an angel from heaven came to give the message Think about what he told her. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. There's that town again no one wants to go to. It's a great town to be from. To a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. O graced one, one who has received grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled, common response in the Bible, just preparing you in case you see an angel, you'll know what to do. She was troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, For you have found favor with God. This young girl, somewhere between 12 and 15 years old, she's just trying to be faithful. She's just trying to do her her daily tasks and go about her duties. She she doesn't have a, a following. She doesn't have a Twitter account. She has no Instagram. The world does not know her name. No one knows anything about her except for the few little people that are in her circle. But God knows her. God has taken note of her. This girl who, if God had not chosen her for this task, the world would have looked past her. The world would have never known her name. She would have lived, she would have died, she would have been forgotten about. But God favored her. God graced her. God was delighted to put his grace upon her and to select her for this task. Why? Because she's just the right kind of girl. She's humble. She's faithful. She trusts the Lord. All of those things come out of this text right here. Do not be afraid, Mary, the angel says, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is Messiah language from beginning to end. And Mary was probably wise enough to be aware of this type of language. And she was aware of the fact that God had chosen her, a young girl from the lineage of David, to bring forth the long-awaited Messiah. Mary doesn't object. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. God will make it happen. God will make it happen, Mary. 
Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Behold, your relative in her old age has also conceived a son, and this in the sixth month with her who is called barren. And here's, here's the kicker. Here's why God chooses the humble. Here's why God delights to tell a story with, laced with humility. For nothing will be impossible with God. And I think this is the point of the Christmas story. This is the reason it was written in such a way. This is the reason the events were chosen the way they were. This is the reason God didn't send forth Jesus to be born in a palace in the middle of, in the heart of Rome. Because that's too common. That's too easy. God actually stacks the deck against himself when he's writing the story. He says, I'll prove it to you world, sinful humanity, I will do this the hardest way possible. I will, I will make everything, stack everything against myself, and I will still prove to you that I am king. Jesus was born to a humble peasant girl in poverty, in a, a foreign land, really, to them, unfamiliar place, with barely anything. Didn't even have a house over their head at the time. But the promise to Mary is that he will be great. He will be great. Why? Because nothing is impossible with God. Here's the, the point God chooses humility because it makes, it makes him look more great. God chooses the humble because in the humble, more of God is put on display. God does not choose the arrogant. God does not choose the prideful. God does not choose the haughty because it makes them look like the hero and God will not share his glory with anybody. So he creates a scene, he creates a scenario, he writes a story in such a way that it looks like from the very beginning it's all going to come apart. It's all going to fail. And if it wasn't for the fact that God is involved in every detail of it, it would fall apart. It's hard to become king of the world. Many men have tried. All of them have failed. When God sends forth his king into the world, he chose the lowliest place, the lowliest people, the lowliest messengers, and still his king is triumphing. Amen? In the humility of Christmas, we, are, we need to be reminded, and we are reminded, because in all these texts there are promises interlaced that it won't end in humility. Jesus' first coming is marked by that word humility, but his second coming is marked by the word glory, power. He will return. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Let me just say this, church. God delights in choosing the humble. God delights in little children. Why? Jesus says in Matthew 18, Truly I say to you, this is on the heels of his disciples saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because God delights to work through the humble. God delights to manifest his glory in the humble. And so if you want to be used by God, if you want to be favored by God, humble yourself. That's the message of the Bible. You want to be overlooked? You want to be bypassed? You want to be forgotten about by God? Exalt yourself. 
But if you are willing to see yourself as Mary, as those shepherds, as Joseph even, if you are willing to acknowledge you're not that important, God will be delighted to favor you, to look upon you with grace. Philippians 2, let me just end with this passage. Paul is writing to a church that's at least two women are fighting with each other and there's probably people taking sides and his primary argument to bring them back together, to bring them to a place of unity is to adopt the attitude of humility. Listen to what he says. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Meaning, He is in heaven, and he has been there for all eternity. And he is equal with God. He shares glory with God because he is God. And he didn't think it's something to grasp onto, to cling tightly to. But he released it. Who though is in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a slave being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The first coming of Jesus, it is marked by humility. He humbles himself to the point of becoming, being made in human form, being taken on human flesh, but then even Beyond that, he's obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. But listen to the end of the verse. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That will happen. At the end of Jesus' earthly life, before he went back into heaven to be with his Father, there were 500 believers who he showed himself to in his resurrection form. 500 believers. Believers, 500 people after three and a half years of ministry, after death and being buried and rising again from the grave, 500 people that believed him. When he comes again in glory, the whole world will acknowledge who he is. The whole world, whether wanting to or not, will bow their knee and will declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? So we are, those of us that believe, are highly favored along with Mary. We are the favored ones because God has looked upon us with grace and God has opened up our eyes to see and to believe this story like a child and to acknowledge with our heart of faith that there is nothing impossible with God. He did bring forth the Messiah, and he will bring forth the Messiah again. This Christmas, as you go home this evening and as you open presents probably in the morning, I pray that you would be reminded of the humility of our King and of the glory of our King. I hope that you will be reminded as this year turns into the next year and as things go from maybe bad to worse, who knows what will happen. Maybe it'll all get better. I hope that you will take great comfort in the fact that your God will send forth our Savior in glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are delighted to be so favored. We don't deserve this, Lord. We have done nothing to earn your favor. It is absolutely given freely. 
We thank you for opening up our eyes and giving us eyes of faith that we might see and read these stories and believe them. And we pray, Lord, that you would cast any sense of pride far from us. May we live and walk in humility. May we, we live amongst each other in a spirit of humility. May we exemplify our Lord in that. But may our hearts always give us comfort by the knowledge that he will come again, that he will bring right and true justice, that he will turn righteousness uh, upside down from what this world calls righteousness. We look forward to the day when our Lord will come and vindicate us. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. So for, for many years now, um, we've been having these Christmas Eve services, and, and there's still some of you out there that know that we've been kind of doing this for, for quite a while, and, and we always end with, with Silent Night. And at one point, we would take our candles and we'd circle the sanctuary and, and just form a unified circle and just sing together. But the Lord's been working, and we can't do that anymore. We can't circle the sanctuary. We don't have a sanctuary big enough for us to circle. And it's just, it's, it's so neat to see, see God working in that way. But we are here, and we have our candles. So go ahead and just twist the bottom. A lot of you probably already know this if you have kids. Um, go ahead and twist the bottom there and turn your candle on. And... Um, we're not going to circle the sanctuary today, but I would appreciate it if you guys would stand up and let's just eliminate the aisles and, and stuff, kind of spread across and let's, let's make us just one single body, just one voice singing praise to our God as we just so come together and, and, uh, just celebrate, um, the birth of Christ and, and uh, just get ready to focus on him tomorrow.
as we, we close up our service and, and uh, go to our homes and everything. I just want to wish everyone here just a very Merry Christmas.